doing, church? How are y'all? Good? Well, hey, welcome to life. Welcome to Crossroads. Welcome to the opportunity that we have to be in the presence of God together and to worship Him and to celebrate how good He is to us, how good He has been for us. So as we go into this time of worship and celebrating God and His presence in our lives, I'm going to ask that you find freedom in how you worship, and I'm going to invite you to worship with us. Church, let's celebrate God this morning.
fact that you love us so much that you sent your son for us. We rejoice in the fact that, that your grace allows us to live new lives. We rejoice in the hope that we have in you. We rejoice in the fact that the power that you um, give us, and that you, the power that you have, that you allow us to be able to move and to breathe and to serve, to be able to worship you with these lives. God, help us to do more than just worship with our mouth. Help us to worship with who we are, how we think, the things we do. Help us to love you even when our mouth's not saying it. Thank you for the opportunity we have to concentrate on you, to lift you up, and to have the opportunity we have to, the, this opportunity that we have to devote ourselves to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
than I've ever been. True life is lived when you stop living for yourself. that he's made you for. Because you are the only one I need. I bow over me at your feet. I worship you. Cause you have, you've given me more than I could ever wanted. And I want to give you my heart and my soul. Cause you. Cause you are the only one I need I bow all of me at your feet I worship you At this time, we, we take a time to just stop and think about what God's done for us and take this little, little piece of bread and a little cup of juice to be reminded of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Uh, none of us deserve it, but he did it for us. Let's pray. Gracious God, Lord, we love you and we thank you for what you've done for us as we take this time to 
to remember. Lord, allow us to uh, partake as a group, but also as an individual, Lord, and just help us to reflect. And Lord, we can't do this life without you. We can't have eternity without you. And Lord, we just thank you for the forgiveness and the grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> that was, uh, I enjoyed that worship set. If you, uh, some of those songs I remember singing in the old building. Do you guys, anybody remember cramming into that old building over there and kind of just brought back some memories of squeezing in, sweating to death, and so cool, though. A lot of good memories back there. So, um, so the series of Wide Open, where we've been encouraging you guys to live differently, to, uh, to evaluate your life, to, to look and see where can I make some changes, but maybe start doing this. And, and we do this, um, encouraging you to go and do this homework so that you can start to maybe change uh, your relationships towards others. Uh, hopefully to change your relationship with God. And so today I want to talk about something that I, I feel like kind of deals with both, your relationship with others and your relationship with God. And that's why I've entitled today's sermon, Wide Open Hands. Wide Open Hands, um, the idea of serving God while serving others. See, this idea of serving, 
Um, and, and it was really hard to kind of write the sermon because when you start to like read the Bible, like there is so many passages that talk with, about serving. And it's, it's where, how do you, where do you really pull out? What do you talk about? Because you can go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. If you go back to Leviticus, where God calls his people, and he's, he's teaching them new ways to live. God is, you can find in Leviticus, God tells his people, hey, when you plant your crops, when you plant your garden and you harvest, that only harvest the, the middle, kind of make a circle around, but leave the corners. And in the very beginning, he's telling people, hey, don't, don't harvest all your food. Leave the corners for those people that, that might have fallen on hard times, that might be a little um, uh, less fortunate than you. That way they can go and, and have some food to eat. He tells us people as when you have your vineyards and you're picking your grapes, just go through one time, pick the grapes. Don't go through a second time and look and see if you missed anything. Leave some stuff for the people that might need some food. And so we find all these verses where God's calling us to live differently, to think of other people, to, to ask ourselves, how can we serve other people? And, and you don't have to look very long in the, the Bible until you start finding these verses that God is calling us to, to serve the poor for the, the, the less fortunate, for the vulnerable. There's a, a Bible commentator who had went through the Bible and, and he wanted to see how many verses talk about serving other people. And, and he found that the number was just shy of 5,000 verses. 5,000 verses that, that call us to live differently, to, to be looking at how we can serve, how we can reach, how we can bless other people. So if something mentioned that many times in the Bible, obviously pretty important. And Jesus comes along, and Jesus comes along at a time when it was tradition for, for a lot of people to gather together. And they would gather together and they would read different passages from the, the Old Testament. And they would have these discussions with one another and, and maybe some arguments with one another. And they would share their opinions and thoughts on, on certain verses. And sometimes they would find themselves arguing about the meaning. And, and as they're discussing these different verse, verse, verses, Sometimes, um, if you would disagree with someone, you would say, hey, you, I think you've abolished the Torah. You've abolished the scriptures. Saying, I, I think you're missing the point here. You're, you're totally wrong about this. And then other times, someone might share an opinion about something, and you say, I, you fulfilled the Torah. I agree with what you have to say. I think you're right on point. And so Jesus, when he would come to town and he'd be teaching, he would say things like in Matthew 5, 17, he says, listen, guys, I've not come to abolish the scriptures, but I've come to fulfill them. And through his teachings, he's telling everybody, if you want to see God, if you want to know who God is, then look at me and look at how I live. If you want to understand how to live out these scriptures, then look at my life and the way that I live. He says, I, I am literally God with skin on. I, I am the entire scriptures come to life. And so if we look at Jesus's life, because we, we have the privilege now to be able to read the Old Testament and the New Testament. We get the entire Bible, you know, in the palm of our hands. And when we're able to look and see the way that Jesus lived, we can see that he spent his entire life loving and serving people constantly right up until his very last breath on earth. You know, if you think about it, just take a step back and think about the idea that Jesus literally left heaven this place where there's no pain, suffering, and heartache, to come down onto this earth. And what does he do? He, he rolls up his sleeves and he just starts serving and loving everybody he comes in contact with. That's why in Matthew 20, 28, Jesus tells everybody, he says, I did not come to this earth to be served. Should he have been served? Like if people truly understood who Jesus was, absolutely. You, you would have seen the disciples saying, Jesus, let me get that for you. Jesus, sit down, take a break, let me do this. There would have been people serving him left and right. He says, I didn't come to be served. I'm not here on this earth. I didn't leave heaven to come down here just so people could serve me, but I came here so I could serve other people. And then all throughout his teachings, this is what he's talking about. In Matthew 25, 40, he says, what you have done for the least of these of mine the hungry, the thirsty, the poor, the naked, the prisoner, the widow, the orphan, the immigrant. He says, whatever you've done for all of these, uh, the least of these people, this, you've done it for me. He gives examples like in Luke 3, he says, if you have two coats, he says, if you have two coats, share it with someone that doesn't have one. Do the same thing with food. If you've got extra food, share it with someone that doesn't have any food. Uh, there's one in Mark. This is a tough one. Mark 9, 35, it says, if anyone would be first, he must make himself last. 
He must make himself all the way at the bottom and he should be the servant of all. See, Jesus didn't just walk around and talk about this kind of stuff. There's all these verses where Jesus is teaching about it, but this is how Jesus actually lived. And he shows us that, that serving is not just something that we do when we have the time, that serving should be our lifestyle. The problem is making it our lifestyle, it's easier said than done. And, and you see, for us to be able to live in the United States with all the, the blessings that come with living in the United States, it, living in the United States also makes this a very difficult thing, especially for us in this day and age. So you've got to realize that most of the Bible, the majority of the Bible is written by a people who were living in lands that were occupied by other superpowers and other empires. Like it's written by a group of people who were on the underside of power. Does that make sense? Like if you, if you look at the Old Testament, um, the, the Bible itself is considered, they call it an oppression narrative. Because the, the majority of the Old Testament is written under the rule of the Egyptian empire, the Babylonian empire, the Assyrians, the, the Persians. And then you get to the New Testament and literally the entire New Testament is written under the rule of the Roman empire. And so we talk about this kind of stuff, but we're living on like the opposite side of what all these people are living. And it makes it hard to understand because we're living as citizens, as, as probably the most powerful empire the world's ever seen. See, I don't think we take that into consideration. When, when you read the, the, the New Testament and you look at the teachings of Jesus and you read about Paul, you see they're, they're living in a world where the, uh, the general thought is much like the way our world is here in America. We, we live in a place where, where it is all about work, make money, get ahead, buy things, uh, keep up with the neighbors, uh, save up, have a retirement so you can retire and, and live and enjoy the spoils of your life. And, and sometimes I think we can miss out on the general theme that was written by a group of people on the opposite side of the power than what we are used to. You see, early churches, the, the early church, the early Christians, they struggled because they found themselves mixing and mingling the, the Christian way of life with the, maybe the Roman way of thinking. See, the Roman way of thinking, listen to this, is all about the, their values were all about work, make money, prosper, buy things, live extravagant lifestyles. Doesn't that kind of sound familiar? And we have to be careful to, to not do the same because I think sometimes we find ourselves mixing maybe the American way of life with the teachings of Jesus. And in reality, they often go against each other. See, I've, I've, I've noticed this trend the past couple of years that, that the language of love, the language of the Bible is not necessarily talked about as much as the language of rights about me, about what I deserve. And, and know that, uh, please know that this is, uh, this is not any kind of political stance. This isn't me leaning one way or the other. This isn't anything specific about, you know, whatever that is going on. But we find ourselves, people saying, That's, what about my rights? What about me? And when you look at the, the language of the Bible and you read the stuff that Jesus is talking about, we see things uh, of doing what's best for other people, loving your neighbor as you love yourself, putting other people first, making yourself last. And you know that way, you know that way is a better way of living than the American way of living. Do you realize th this idea of rights, this idea of rights that, that we find ourselves talking about a lot, this actually originated in the Roman Empire. And, and looking back, if, and I love rights. I love the right to free speech. I love the, the right to, to assemble peaceably. I, I, this is great stuff. And, and the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, very great things for our country. This actually originated in the Roman Empire. You know, the time of Jesus and, and the disciples in the early church, this originated in the Roman Empire way of thinking. So in reality, we find ourselves struggling with often the same things that the early church found themselves struggling with. Of being, uh, do I live as part of the Roman Empire with this mindset of me, 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 or do I live with the mindset of Jesus that makes it all about other people and serving? And we need to learn that, that we 
We need to make this life less about ourselves and more about others. And Jesus knew that this was going to be a struggle for his disciples. He knew, he, he knew the Roman government. He knew the, the, the way that people lived. And he knew that this was going to be tough. After he left for his disciples and the, the people that would follow him, they would struggle. Do I live the, the Roman way of life? Or do I live this way that's totally opposite and follow Jesus? That's why on his last night on earth, he chose to wash the disciples' feet. You know, people like John, who, who he loved, he knelt down in front and he washed his feet. And Peter, Peter struggled with this concept. He says, Jesus, there's no way I'm going to let you serve me. Do you realize that, that Jesus washed Judas' feet? That he knelt in front of Judas, this, this guy that in just a few hours was going to stab him in the back. And Jesus still chose to knelt in front of him and wash his feet. Because he needed to show these guys that there's something more in this world. And in John 13, 15, he says, listen, guys, I've set the example. What I've just done for you, this is the example of how you should live. Go and do what I've done. And the cool thing about it is when you read about the disciples, when you jump past the gospels to the book of Acts, and you look at how they lived and what they did, they, they actually did it. In the book of Acts, it talks about the early church. So this is after Jesus died and, and he rose again and he ascended to heaven and now it's up to these disciples. And the disciples, they, it says that they just start preaching. They just start gathering together in groups and start preaching and teaching these things that Jesus taught them. This is where we get this idea of church. It was called ecclesia and these people would start coming and it just says every day the numbers were growing and it just became this huge gathering of people and they started to call themselves the way. They said, we're, we're going to just call this group of, of people the way. And they, they got this because of when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And they said, this is the way right here. We want to spend time talking about Jesus. And other people, they would look at these, this group of people and they would call them Christians. This is where we get the word Christians. And it, it translates as little Christ. So they say these people are truly living like little versions of Jesus. And they were out feeding the poor. They were taking care of the widows. They were, uh, you know, there was this really cool thing that they did where they, they were taking these uh, care of these discarded babies. Uh, th this is outside of scripture, but Roman law would allow that if you had a child and you couldn't take care of it, or, or maybe there was, for some reason, you, you didn't want the baby, or, or there was some sort of disability, there was this law that said you could take the baby into the wilderness and just leave it. And, and you're kind of washing your hands of it and saying, I'm not, I know this is terrible, but I'm not killing the baby, but I'm just letting nature run its course. If, if the baby dies, then it dies. If it lives, then it lives. It was a, a terrible mindset in the, the Roman Empire. And it was these early Christians that were scouting the wilderness and they were, they were picking up these babies and, and they were bringing them home and, and they were raising them as, a, as their own children. And they were, they were doing these crazy things like just selling off their possessions. Anything that they had that they didn't need, they were just selling and they were giving all their money to the church. And in the book of Acts, one of the coolest verses just says there was no needs amongst their community. They were just using that money and just dumping it back into the community of anybody that needed it. If you didn't have food, it's okay. The, the, the early church was there. If you didn't have clothes, if you needed anything, they were right there. And no needs amongst the people. And then other people were seeing this way of living and they were saying, man, this is totally different than anything that we've been raised to believe in the Jewish faith, the way the Jewish faith was changing. They're like, this is so much different. The, the Roman Empire, the, this Roman way of thinking, they were saying, this is so much more beautiful than this way of living all about the extravagant lifestyle. And they wanted this for their own life, and the numbers were growing day by day. See, there's this part in Acts, and it eventually gets so crazy, like Peter and John are just out, and they're just serving the people, and they're just feeding the people and taking care of people. And, and there's actually this, this cool time where the people come to them and say, guys, you've got to stop serving like, you're the people that were listening to Jesus. You spent three years with Jesus. Please stop serving for a second and come and teach us. And he's like, tell us more about Jesus. Stop feeding everybody for a second. We'll take care of that. And, and that's where the mindset of the church. They wanted to know more about Jesus. They wanted to serve other people. But that's what Jesus did. And that's how they chose to live their life. Or look at Jesus' other, um, and one of his other disciples, this was his brother, James. 
In the book of James, um, about 30 years after Jesus' death, James writes this letter to all of the, the Christians, the Jesus followers in the area. This was just a couple years before he was killed for his faith. And when you read the book of James, this is kind of a, a summary of all of his wisdom, all of his experience of being a, a disciple. Um, he was also one of the, the main leaders of the early church. See, James saw the way that Jesus loved and served other people, and, and he knew that, that this was critical for what it means to be a follower of Jesus. In, in the chapter 2, that there's some great passages um, that talk about serving, but, but James kind of is one of those guys that kind of gets in your face. He's older. I think he's one of those old guys that just kind of says whatever's on his mind. He doesn't care who it offends. My, my great-grandmother used to tell my family when they'd gain weight, they'd say, oh, you gained weight. Like one of those people where you just like tell people how it is. This was James. He's old. He doesn't care anymore. He's just going to tell you how it is. And if you don't like him, he doesn't. Who cares? He's only got a few years left on this earth. And so chapter 2 is actually an interesting chapter because if you've read chapter 2 or you've been in church, this is actually a, a chapter that gets argued about a lot amongst uh, uh, Christians. Because in chapter 2, they, they say that James contradicts Paul. Okay, Paul says that it's all about your faith, and they say that James says, no, it's all about your actions. It's all about your works. It's all about your service. Um, but you have to understand when we read this that, that they're actually saying the same thing. It's two sides of the same, co the same coin. Paul is saying um, the root of your salvation is your faith, and, and James is saying the fruit of your salvation is your works. Right, you, you've got to, once you have faith, then that should grow into works and service and, and going out and helping other people. So the root causes the fruit. Does that make sense? All right, so no root, no fruit. Root causes fruit. Um, and so look at how James starts out. He, I mean, he comes out in verse 14, doesn't pull any punches, and he says, what good is it, guys, if you say that you have faith, but you do not show it by your actions? And then he asks this question. He says, can this, this kind of faith, the way you're living your life, can this save you? That last line, that last line itself should be haunting for yourself. To be able to look at your life, and because real faith should have some sort of proof in your life. So the idea behind this was for his readers, the ones that read his letter, and for us today as we read this, to be able to ask yourself, what proof do I have in my life that I follow, that I have faith in Jesus? And it's more than just words. He says it right here. It's more than just talk. You can't just say, oh, I was baptized a few years ago. I go to church every Sunday. I, I read my Bible. I sing the songs. I listen to the, the river radio station every day in my car, even though they play the same five songs over and over again. <laughs> he says, it's more than just words, guys. This guy saw how Jesus lived, and he's looking around at all these early church Christians, and he says, you guys are acting nothing like Jesus did. And then he goes on in verse 15, and he gives us an example because he wants to show us just how stupid this is. He says, suppose you see a brother or sister, and they have no food or clothing. And then you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat well. This is like the equivalent of us saying, I'll, I'll pray for you. No, you're not. You're not going to pray. It's just your way to get out of the conversation. He says, I'll pray for you. And then you go off and you do nothing. You don't give that person food or clothing. What does that do? He says, you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it, it produces good deeds. Your faith is no good unless it produces fruit. He said, if it doesn't, then it's, it's dead and it's useless. I've heard this, uh, this theologian, um, I read this this week. He explained this verse like this. He says, it would be like this, this kind of giving this dead faith to God. is kind of like telling your kids you're going to, to buy them a new puppy and you end up handing them this dead dog. And he says it's, it's vile and it's repulsive and it's disgusting to God. And he says, James wants us to realize that this is how God views our faith when it's only words, that it's just us talking. Verse 18, he says, now someone may argue, some people have faith, others just have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have any good deeds? He says, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You look at my life. You look at the way that I love, the way that I serve, and that's how I'm going to show you that I have faith. He says, go ahead, talk about your faith all day, but I'm going to show you my faith by what I do. 
And then verse 19, James gets really fired up. He says, you, you say you have faith? You say that, that you believe that there is one God? He says, good for you. I, I picture like the, the sarcastic like baby voice. I'm like, oh, good job. Good job, little kid. You believe that there's one God? He says, even the demons believe that. Even the demons in hell believe that there's one God. He says, how foolish. Can't you see that faith without these deeds is useless? The word for foolish here is moros. Moros translates as moron. So James says, you morons, can't you see that you are no better than the demons in hell? He said that these demons in hell, they believe in one God, but they don't choose to allow it to change their life. You're exactly like these demons. Your faith without action is useless. And then he continues in, in 21. He says, look at Abraham. He says, by his actions, when he offered his son as a, a sacrifice um, on the altar, he, see, he said his faith and his actions work together. And he knows that some people are saying, yeah, but that's Abraham. Abraham is like one of those Old Testament like heroes. And he says, okay, then what about Rahab the prostitute? He doesn't just call her Rahab. He points out the fact that she was a prostitute at the time when, when she showed her faith. And not just that she believed that there was one God, but she chose to hide the messengers and, and sent them safely away on a different road. He says, look at the way Rahab lived. She didn't have her life all together. Like she, she was living on the, the opposite side of things, but she had faith in this God and she allowed it to change her life. And you see that in her actions. These verses by James, they're... When you read these, they were meant to be a mirror for the early followers. And it's meant to be a mirror for us that we can hold up to ourselves. To cause us to look at our own lives and our own actions and see, is our faith true? Are, am I able to look at our li my life and see that, that I'm actually living differently? Or is my faith dead and worthless? I, I think this is a, a good test. You know, the past few weeks we've been giving you guys homework. What has changed in your life, you know, come Monday morning? What's different about the way that you're living throughout the week? Have you seen any changes than to just come here and talk about your faith and, and the way that you should be living? Are you actually living differently? Are you seeing different actions throughout your week? Yeah, I think we've, we've turned faith into just this Sunday kind of mechanism where we come and we sing the songs and we listen to the sermons and we read these verses and then we get to go out to eat afterwards. And, and that's okay until we start believing that simply knowing stuff about the Bible and simply listening and singing to songs and, and listening to the sermon is actually us living out the love of Jesus. That's not living out the love of Jesus. Living out the love of Jesus demonstrates itself as going out and feeding someone that's hungry, that giving someone your jacket when they're cold, taking time to listen, doing something for other people and expecting nothing in return from it. Do you realize that this passage, these, these group of verses that we talked about, this is literally how we end every Sunday at church because James is saying, guys, stop talking about your faith, stop talking about church and actually go out and be the church to other people. He says, let's start helping other people. Let's start loving people. Let's start blessing people. When you see someone in need, move closer to them. Stop moving away from them. Start living, start serving, start loving the way that Jesus did. There was too many people that were talking about Jesus, but wasn't actually living the way that Jesus did. And he said, faith is not a concept. This is a lifestyle. I think James is just as much relevant to us today as it was to the early church. I don't think a lot of you realize that your life is going to preach a better sermon in the way that you live than anything that we could ever preach from this stage. Your life should be a walking sermon that points everybody back to Jesus. The, the way you live, the way that you love, the way that you treat people and serve people, that should be the way that people look at that and say, man, that is so much better than the way that I'm living. I want what you have. I talked about Peter, how he struggled with the fact that Jesus was going to wash his feet. Peter's life did a huge 180. When you look at who he was and, and what he struggled with to who he eventually became, Peter understood serving. And in 1 Peter 4.10, 
Peter says, each of you should use whatever gift you've been given to serve others. Each of you, each of you in this room, whatever gift you have, whatever you've been blessed with, that's been given to you so you could use that to serve other people. The disciples, they understood this calling that, that their lives should be a reflection of Jesus. If we want to call ourselves Christians today, then we need to be exactly what that name implies, little versions of Jesus. That when people look at us, uh, that they can see Jesus. That means that there's stuff in our life that we need to change. See, I, th I think the issue comes that we really, really, really like Jesus. I don't think, I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that. But I think if you're honest today, I don't know if a, a lot of you really want to become like Jesus. Like we, we admire his humility. We admire the way that he was able to serve people. But are you ready to be that humble? I mean, it's so beautiful that Jesus would wash the feet of his disciples. But is that really the goal of your life? To really be that kind of servant? You know, it, Jesus washed Peter and John's feet, some of his best friends. Like, that's easy. It's easy to serve the people we love. Judas? The Judas in your life? The person you can't stand? The person that drives you crazy? The person you hate? Are you ready to serve that person? You're thankful for when we, we, we talk about how Jesus was, was spit on and abused and mocked and that he did all of that for us. But man, are you ready to allow that to happen to you? I mean, we love the fact that Jesus laid down his life. Jesus gave up all of his rights to die for us. But we spend so much time arguing and fighting for us. Me, me, me. See, what it comes down to is we really like Jesus the Savior. Jesus the Savior is great. We love talking about Jesus the Savior, but sometimes we're not ready for Jesus the role model. 1 John 2.6 says, Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. It's not an optional thing. We don't get to just kind of pick and choose. We have to live the way that Jesus did. We're going to close and, and sing a song. And, and just like I said, I want you to reflect on this passage from James. This idea of, of holding these verses up to your life like a mirror. And ask yourself these questions, the, the, the ones that we started out with in James 2.14. It says, if, if you talk a good talk, if you say all the right things, you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions, you don't show it by the way that, that you choose to treat people throughout the week, the, the way you choose to love people, if, if you don't allow that faith to change the, how you serve, can that faith really save you? I don't know. That's one of those questions that I think each of us needs to answer as we look at our own life. Is the way that I'm living, the, the, this faith that I've made for my life, is that faith going to save me? Or is it just words? Is it just me talking and going through the, the Sunday routine? That's between you and God. Has the goodness of God in what he's done for you truly changed you? So right now, I want to ask that you stand. And we're going to sing this song. And I want you to, to reflect on these words, but, but reflect on your own life and ask yourself, does my faith show itself by the way that I choose to live? Let's close and, and sing.
For your mercy never fails me For all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Hope I will sing Of the goodness of God You have been faithful And all my life you have been so
this idea of serving. Um, this is something I, I'm super passionate about. I, I, I went back, I've been here 12 years now, and I, I've pulled out about uh, 12 different sermons. I think I preach on this at least once a year. Um, I enjoy preaching on it because, because I want this to change your life. Because the, the way that it's changed my life, I, I, I grew up in the church, and, and, and sometimes that comes with its own struggles where you find yourself falling into the routine of church. But when I was in high school, I remember um, being part of this club, and we would start going to, like, soup kitchens. And then just how much that kind of changed my thinking. And then going into college and doing this and then getting married and Ann and I would do a lot of stuff with the homeless and, and just realize that, that for us, sometimes like we find ourselves feeling closer to God when we're out serving than we do any other time. And when we fully grasp God's love for us, like we were more open to want to just continue to go out and, and to serve God by serving other people. And man, we have got to see, we've got to do some pretty cool stuff. I don't talk about this a lot, but but just through, just God use us, what can we do? And, and doing this, that through the summers when, when I'm not teaching, um, we have an ice cream truck now. We're like, where in the world does, like, I look out almost every day, I'm like, God, where in the world does ice cream truck come from? It's sitting in my front yard. And, and everybody loves ice cream. Ice cream makes everybody happy. And, and we get to, through our food pantry, drive around and, and we just hand out free ice cream. Everybody loves ice cream, makes them happy. But you know what they love even more? Free ice cream. And we get to just do this and just like every, crying about an ice cream truck. <laughs> Be able to do this and say, God, just thank you for using us because I know I know what it did for our life. I know when you choose to leave this building and to serve of what it does to your relationship with God, what it does to your relationship with others. We sang some, some tough songs today. I mean, I was like, listen to the lyrics. Like if you're singing that stuff and you really mean it, that stuff's dangerous to say. God, I, I give you everything. God, take me higher. God, take me deeper. That, that can be dangerous. That can really change your life. But if you truly mean that and, and you really step back and say, God, here I am, wide open hands, ready to serve you in any way, you will not believe what God could do through your life. But that ultimately is up to you and what you choose to do when you leave this building. The rest is up to you. Let's pray. God, just thank you for the example that you've given us. God, I, we talk a lot about faith in you, but God, thank you for your faith in us that, that you trust us to, to take all of this and to go out into the world and to be able to, to do what you did. God, help us to be able to do what you do change our hearts, break our hearts, to be able to treat people and, and love people the way that you did. God, thank you for loving us. It's in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jay. Thanks, everybody. Jason, I've cried about an ice cream truck, too, because I couldn't catch up to it. I was running, and I got that run, you know, strange side ache, you know? Hey, before we go on past that, though, you know, maybe you should start praying for your ice cream truck. I don't know. Jason and Ann kind of laid their life down in front of Christ and said, here, use us. And God gave them something they never expected to have, an ice cream truck. What's yours? What is it that you need to lay your life before God and say, here, use me, and he's going to deliver something for you to use that's going to change your life, choke you up, provide all the ice cream. Maybe you should be praying about your ice cream truck, okay? All right.
Thanks for being here. We just got a couple announcements. At this time, parents, if you checked a kiddo into the children's ministry, now would be the time to go fetch them, or we're going to put them out in the woods, and you know what that means. I listened to the sermon. You know, I thought about that. As an adult, I couldn't even go out in the woods and live. Terrible. I can't change my own diaper. Let's move on. Next Sunday, it's Riot. That's the junior and senior high ministry. That's from 6 to 7. You guys were done in 48 minutes last week. I deserve some extra time. And somebody said, somebody, I said, what in the world? You guys were done in 48 minutes? And they said, us, because you weren't up there talking. Feel the love. And besides that, ladies, Bible study will also be happening next Sunday from 6 to 7. Christine has been in the back passing out books. Here's something new. On June 12th in the evening, it's a Sunday, it's a Sunday evening at 7 p.m., we're going to have a night of worship. Um, and we invite you to come and worship with us. As you see, it's also a mission trip benefit. Uh, we will be uh, taking up a love offering for those of us that are going to Alaska uh, this summer. And um, um, Molster and Amori are going. Jody and Briley are going. And... I almost said it, but I didn't. Reagan Campbell is going as well. So there's a bunch of us that's going to Alaska, and I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Oh, Jeff, is that really a mission trip? I mean, I've seen the shows. It's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. Well, to be honest with you, I talked to my wife yesterday about this. I know, I know we're going to be taking up a love offering. To be honest with you, I don't, I don't care if we don't get a dollar. I really don't. What I care about is for you to come and worship our great God and to pray for us and pray with us. Um, because if it ain't a mission trip, I don't really wanna go, okay? So I really want God to ordain exactly what's gonna happen when the group of us go with uh, uh, 30 some other people to Alaska. And I really, I really am asking for you to pray that God would do something great with the group of 40 of us that are going to be going to Alaska. And so on this night, on June 12th, we're going to get together. We're gonna, I'm going to invite some of the people that are going to Alaska to come up here and to worship with us. And I'm really just going to ask that, that, I mean, I'm just kind of saying, hey, God, here's this week. What, what do you want? How, how, how can I serve you? And I know the rest of us feel the same way. So we encourage you to mark that on your calendar and join us for a night of worship. Like I said, you don't have to... You don't have to pitch in a buck. I get it. Just come and pray with us and worship with us, all right? And I believe that is it. So, congregation said, be the church, see y'all.